Hello my friends, what is up? It is Kat here. Thank you guys so very much for coming back and joining me today. I hope you guys are doing so well as always. As many of you guys know, during the sag after strike, I pretty much put my channel on hold and avoided discussing any film or television content. And holy smokes, it totally is true that once you can't have something, you just want it all the more very badly. <laughs> and during that downtime during the strike, when out of solidarity, I couldn't be discussing those things, I I just wanted to so badly. I was flooded with all of these different ideas for videos, different topics, different shows that I wanted to branch out and talk to you guys about. And I realized during that time that there are so many great shows that I've enjoyed that I've just never shared with you guys here or never discussed on the channel. And in my opinion, a lot of these shows are seemingly very, very underrated. Like the only other person that I know who has seen today's show in particular is my husband, Tom. <laughs> and even though during that time, yes, I very much missed discussing film and television. I was also just fueled with a desire to bring some attention to these shows, especially during a strike uh, when actors, you know, were fighting for fair wages and whatnot. I really wanted to just give shout out and pay credit where it's due and show my adoration and appreciation for some of these shows that I've really enjoyed. This is also selfishly coming from a place of I am actively trying to rally anybody else who has watched this show so that we can discuss because like I said, I only know one other person who has seen it. So I wanted to play around and try out a little new series here on this channel, underrated sci-fi, particularly for today. Other episodes might include shows that I personally love that aren't necessarily in the confines of sci-fi, but I still love them and want to draw attention to them. And so today we will be discussing underrated sci-fi, War of the Worlds. You're probably familiar with H.G. Wells' classic novel, War of the Worlds, published in 1898, which tells the story of a Martian invasion of Great Britain. At the very least, you have probably heard the old stories about the radio play adaptation that seemingly sparked a mass hysteria. In the War of the World by H.G. Wells. <laughs> On October 30th, 1938, a 23-year-old Orson Welles, funny enough, no relation to H.G. Wells, it's spelled differently, performed a dramatized adaptation of War of the Worlds live on CBS radio in which the script had been revised to, instead of take place in London and Southern England, they pinpointed New Jersey. <laughs> and I believe they actually even pinpointed a specific town in New Jersey and just slightly tweaked the name a little bit. It, it was a mythical town, but it was, uh, it was, uh, it was not enough. It's so high. It, it it was, it was near enough to a real name. I've forgotten how we figured it out. It's either that it's Grover's Mills or it is Grove's Mill or something. At any anyway, rate, we, we changed it slightly. Because of course, it would be in New Jersey. <laughs> This is coming from someone who loves New Jersey, okay? But Wells famously stated after the fact that he genuinely believed that listeners would have the wherewithal to recognize that this was a fake broadcast and it was not actually live breaking news of an alien invasion on New Jersey. <laughs> I have no idea how many people are listening and what they're thinking. I had every hope that uh that the people would be excited as they would be at a melodrama. The caveat here was that at the time, radio plays regularly had a kind of halftime intermission, so listeners were expecting this break. This broadcast, however, didn't have a scheduled break until two thirds of the way through the reading of the play. So for anybody who tuned in late and say just missed the introductory message that this was a dramatic reading, that this was a radio play of War of the Worlds, if they happened to miss that, they were then waiting and agonizing 40 minutes long, thinking that this was real. Now the troops are on the edge of the Wilmot Farm. 7,000 armed men closing in on an old metal tube. A tub, rather. Well, wait, that wasn't a shadow, it's something moving. But it's, it's standing on legs, actually rearing up on a sort of metal framework. Therefore, inciting mass hysteria and <laughs> absolute panic. Mass hysteria! People believed it. They really believed it that night. And I think of the ones who were begging us to get connections to their families, to their husbands, before the world came to an end, so they could just tell them they loved them. The next day, Wells awoke to reports of mass hysteria incited by the reading, including stampedes, and people were threatening to allegedly shoot him on sight because they were so PO'd, because they genuinely believed that this was a real live reporting of an ongoing invasion. But he maintained that he never ever intentionally sought to provoke or incite this kind of hysteria. He genuinely believed that people would be able to pick up on the fact that this was super fake, but even some journalists called him out on this, alleging that he delivered an extremely dramatic and very well done performance to the point that there's no way he could have assumed that people were not going to believe it. Don't you think that somebody here would have been able to gauge the reaction which in fact has occurred throughout the United States? 
Well, every radio program tries to be more dramatic than life, as every play tries to be more dramatic than life in every movie. He's an artist, you know? And of course, this did not harm his career in the long run, because as we know, Orson Welles went on to become one of the most prolific filmmakers of probably all time, so. I suppose we had it coming to us because, in fact, we weren't as innocent as we meant to be. People, you know, do suspect what they read in the newspapers and what people tell them, but when the radio came, and I suppose now television, anything that came through that new machine was believed. Since then, there have been numerous cinematic adaptations of the original novel, including a film in 1953, followed by the more famous 2005 adaptation from Steven Spielberg, starring Tom Cruise. Today, we're going to look at the television series War of the Worlds. It premiered in 2019 on French television network Canal Plus, as well as Star, which is apparently a subsidiary of Disney Plus, so. And it follows a darker, much more modernized adaptation of what might actually go down if the world as we know it was to be ruined by an alien invasion? So I honestly had never even heard of this show before, <laughs> if I'm being real. I had seen a billboard for it while driving around Los Angeles and it piqued my interest and so we checked it out and holy smokes, I did not know what to expect going in, but it very quickly proved that it was a lot, a lot. It was a lot, it's a lot, in a good way, in a good way. The series was created by Howard Overman, whose work also includes series like Atlantis and Misfits. The first season of episodes is split by directors Gilles Coulier and Richard Clark, who happened to direct a few episodes of Doctor Who. So I think a reason why this is maybe underrated rather or not yet reach the masses, I feel like, amongst the American audience is because the series first premiered in 2019 in France and then was later released to the United States audience via Epics. The show's third season concluded in September 2022, and up until now I didn't know what the future fate of the series was until I learned for the sake of this video that allegedly, according to Wikipedia, it was the third and final season, so I'm sad about that. <laughs> But for the sake of this video, and in the hopes of perhaps drawing a little bit of interest to this show, and maybe encouraging you to check it out if you have access to MGM Plus or Canal Plus, I'm going to be discussing the events of the pilot episode and a little bit partially of the second episode, but really like a fraction, not even anything that major. There will be spoilers for the very first episode. The pilot episode follows astronomer Catherine Durand as she embarks on what is seemingly a regular day in her life at her post at the IRAM facility in the French Alps, which is the Institute of Radio Astronomy Millimetrique. Uh, sorry, my French is not good. This is actually a real place, and it's Europe's current leading center for radio astronomy. What is radio astronomy, you might ask? I was going to insert a little bit of a definition about it and actually try to attempt to do some research on it for the sake of this segment of the video, but um, my brain can't comprehend. <laughs> I don't even know. But the point is you do not really need to understand what they do for a living because they make it very clear that this is just seemingly a normal day in the life. It's very mundane. They pretty much are just monitoring radio frequencies. And you do not need to know much about radio astronomy to know that very shortly, something very unusual and abnormal comes up on their radar. Catherine detects an unusual signal that, after they rule out, is definitely not a satellite. She explains it could not be happening naturally from anything of this Earth. There's no naturally occurring phenomena that can produce a signal like this. Once they realize that they're onto something, they decide they need to make the call. Make the call. The call being that they've seemingly found signs of extraterrestrial life, and Catherine gets to go to NATO to explain the situation. The power source that generated the signal is greater than we can even conceive. Meanwhile, we head over to London where we meet Bill Ward, who is played by Gabriel Byrne. And I'm just going to take a second here to fangirl. I am a huge fan, personally, of Gabriel Byrne's work. In terms of his acting, he's so just simple, which doesn't sound like it would be a compliment, but, but my favorite types of acting are those that are very internalized. You can't tell that the actor is thinking, they just are, and he makes it look so easy and natural. So I was naturally super excited to see him in this show. I really, really love his work and he's phenomenal in this role. Anyways, Bill is a professor of neurobiology in London. And everybody in his class starts to uh, freak out a little bit as the news slowly trickles in that perhaps there has been a discovery of extraterrestrial life. This is an element here of the pilot and the way the events play out that I actually really enjoyed and I find to be very relatable and probably accurate 
to what would happen in the real world. I like the social media element as everybody's phones slowly start pinging, they start realizing what's going on. And it's kind of interesting to compare to the mass hysteria incited by Orson Welles' original reading, the radio play. You know, in today's world, news definitely has more of a trickle effect. It's not like we're all actively listening to the radio at the same time and then running it around in our backyards thinking that the world is gonna end. Note that while Catherine is making her case to NATO, we meet Bill's son, Dan, who works for the British government. He later informs his dad that the government is relocating all of their employees to their safe, secret underground bunker. But seemingly for now, they don't want to necessarily believe that there is inherently a threat, as Catherine has explained to NATO. There's no reason for them to necessarily believe that an attack or anything would ensue, that this is just simply maybe another being, other life forms reaching out to us as we would do to them, trying to make contact. Perhaps they were looking for us but naturally everyone is starting to take precautions. In the midst of all this, we get acquainted with the Gresham family, their mom, Sarah, their daughter, Emily, and their son, Tom, played by Ty Tennant, who you might recognize from his role as young Aegon in House of the Dragon, season one. Their father, Jonathan, is traveling in France for a work trip. The Greshams don't necessarily have a huge role to play in the pilot, however, they are a larger part of the series, but they definitely serve as a vessel for the audience, representative of what the layperson's experience would be like in an actual scenario like this if you're not getting the inside scoop from the government themselves, if you don't work for the government, if you're not a scientist actively making this discovery, you know, Bill and Catherine are getting the inside scoop, the play-by-play, -play. but the Greshams definitely represent what the actual population would be like if you don't have access to a scientist or a government official who knows the scoop. And we also meet Kareem, who is seemingly trying to smuggle his way into London and get out of France, and in doing so, he hides himself in a cement mixer, I think. That is very important and it will come up later. Up until this point, there is not seemingly a threat until the alleged extraterrestrial life disperses unidentified objects across the globe, specifically targeting major cities and densely populated areas. Though these objects don't pose an initial threat, Bill just on his own time, literally just for fun, nobody asked him to do this, he's doing this out of curiosity. Out of his own interest, he's going to analyze the frequencies, the signals that these probes are seemingly emitting. And he realizes in the process that the frequency is actually designed to eliminate the human population. In lay terms, he realizes that the signals would basically cause the brain to just cease brain function. Everybody would just die. Cause seizures and our bodies will shut down completely. Are you sure? As sure as it can be. And the only way to protect oneself or prevent this would be to seek shelter underground or in an enclosed metal case of some sort, like a cement mixer. People need to get somewhere completely encased in metal or deep underground. So Bill calls up Dan and he's like, y'all gotta tell somebody, y'all gotta warn the public. People need to start taking shelter. But the government up until this point has seemingly been paralyzed and they're trying to prevent mass hysteria until they know a thousand percent that there actually is a threat, that there actually will be an attack. Even though everyone's already pretty panicked, and the cities are evacuating. It's crazy congested traffic. Nobody can actually get out of France or London. Dan even notices that his boss, the minister, brings her children with her as they go to relocate into the bunker, despite the fact that she had already insisted to the public that they shouldn't leave their own homes, but she brought her children as a precaution. People should stay in their own homes. It's the safest place for them to be. Your family are here. Just a precaution until things calm down. Sure, Dan. So Dan quickly realizes that this warning from his dad is falling on deaf ears. And because he's a real one, he is a goat. He's going to take matters in his own hands. And he hacks into the British government's Twitter and leaks. Sorry, I shouldn't be laughing, but he's just, he's a real one. He's amazing. He leaks a warning to the public, basically telling everyone, get the flip underground right now or you will die. Everyone's running. Everyone's freaking out. Everyone's trying to get underground ASAP or find a metal tube of somewhere. Bill, for example, goes, hides in an elevator. And then... It happens. I rewatched the first episode here for the sake of the video, and honestly, the buildup to the attack is just absolutely chaotic, heart racing, literally like on the edge of your seat, panic. And it's especially interesting, but also just terrifying because at the end of the day, everybody really was just fending for themselves. It took Dan having to leak it onto their Twitter of all places. Like that's how you had to find out. If you weren't on Twitter, I don't know how you learned because he leaked it and seemingly like five minutes later, the attack happened. It really makes your heart race and there's just all out chaos. But funny enough, the actual attack itself was very unceremonious, dare I say, 
anticlimactic? And you know, I think I will lean into the fact that this was seemingly anticlimactic for an apocalyptic end of the world event, but in a way it really magnifies the horror behind the fact that the human population was literally obliterated within the blink of an eye. Everyone just but it's the aftermath that's the exciting part. Well, actually not exciting, it's terrifying. It's terrifying from here on out. And that's the first episode. And you might think that that's a major spoiler that, oh, everybody dies, shocker, but the show really focuses on the human spirit and human nature when you're tested in a survival situation like this, when there is like only a handful of people left fighting to survive. When it comes to the characters, the series really explores the idea of what it means to be a hero, when in reality those who survived just got lucky. <laughs> For example, Tom and Emily's dad only survives because he bribed a cab driver to fast and furious him to the closest train station and in the process the driver like crashes en route and flips them into the ocean and that's how he survives because he was underwater which is actually a really interesting hack. But the driver's like, you know, yes clearly very harmed, but Jonathan just escapes anyway and doesn't even try to save the driver. Granted, he was going to drown, but it's very fun to watch the series toy with what happens to the moral compass when you're in a dire apocalyptic situation like they are about to face. Yet, it's funny to see that even in the aftermath, you know, the human spirit, human nature, everyone's still looking amongst one another, searching for somebody else to be the hero. They're desperately looking for heroes amongst one another because there's seemingly no government, no military, no authoritative figure to help anybody survive at this point. This is just a little example, but it's one of my favorite quips in the entire show and maybe even one of like my favorite scenes in anything ever when two groups of survivors encounter each other and they ask each other this. Are you a soldier? Graphic designer. And that's what's super interesting about this series, just watching how regular normal people have to become soldiers, have to fight to survive, and what they will do when their morality and survival are pitted against each other. And as we see throughout the show, some people definitely become morally questionable when survival is on the line. At that point, it's not even a question of morals, it's a question of survival of the fittest. Even in the very first episode, when Bill learns of the impending doom, the impending attack, he runs to his ex-wife's place to try to save her, which is romantic and cute. But in the process, he totally decks her new boyfriend out of a moment of frustration, and he goes absolutely just pummeling down the stairs. And Bill just keeps, keeps going. The world is about to end in one minute. He doesn't have time. He's going to get his wife. And so they already plant that seed of he's willing to do whatever it takes to save her, of course, but even at the cost of maybe human life and not saving another person, you know, there's a lot of moral ambiguity there. Later on when they discover his body after the attack, you know, of course he doesn't tell his wife what happened. He plays it off as if he was a victim of the attack, like all the other dead bodies in their apartment. But I think they make a note to show that even Bill is contemplating the possibility of, did this guy die in the attack or did Bill kill him out of frustration because he wouldn't get out of his way? And this is the hero of the show Show, folks, this is one of the main protagonists. So there's a lot of moments like that that the series explores that I really just love to see an assessment of human nature and what people will do to each other, to one another, if they think that they are a threat to survival. And I always just love seeing in dystopian situations like this. I guess I don't love seeing it, but it's a very common thread that more often than not in these post-apocalyptic dystopian scenarios, people turn against each other, which always just perplexes me. It's something about, for example, The Last of Us, other people become just as grave of a threat as what the actual like antagonist is. Other reasons to check out the show, the series itself is visually stunning. Cinematographer David Williamson received two BAFTA Simru Simru, yes, it's the Welsh BAFTA Awards, I believe. Nominations for photography and lighting, and I would say those are extremely well-deserved. It's actually miraculous and kind of mind-blowing how they're able to get some of these shots of densely populated cities like London and France with seemingly nobody in the frame looking extremely believably abandoned and apocalyptic. Never at any point in this series do you think that something is filmed with a green screen. Everything is shot on location. The locations are beautiful. It's actually kind of one of the more redeeming parts of like the tragedy that ensues is that the serenity that they're still 
able to capture these wide city shots, capturing the stillness of, again, these major cities. I don't know how they were able to shut down to get some of the shots that they do, but they're breathtaking. And it's truly, truly believable that this is our real world and that it's completely uninhabited. Another element of the show that I also really appreciate is that yes, even though there is a frick ton of scientific jargon, of course, they're exploring extraterrestrial life. There is a lot of science, but it is always padded with enough explanation that even if you're a nimrod like me like i am the least scientifically intelligent person i think you might ever encounter seriously take it from me i did not even take physics but they still make it palatable to someone like me they provide enough explanation and context along the way so that you can still very easily follow along the science is all executed in a very palatable way that in no way shape or form impedes on the viewing experience if you're like me and don't know anything about the universe <laughs> overall though i think my favorite aspect of the show it's just how accurate it feels, even though we've never lived through anything like this. And you'll notice I haven't actually mentioned anything about who these aliens are, who are the perpetrators of this attack, who's coming for us. I do not want to spoil that, but that is a huge reason to keep watching if you're interested. And that's where the series definitely takes a little bit of a turn from the H.G. Wells original classic. It's not your typical Martians. I'll just say that. As if we know what typical Martians look like. And of course this show does deal with a lot of post-apocalyptic themes like morality and death. It is quite tragic, I am not going to lie. I think that's one thing I was really not prepared for. Even the second time around when I was re-watching some of the episodes for the sake of this video, I was actually bawling all over again. I didn't even cry the first time I watched the show, probably because I was watching with Tom. I guess it's easier to watch something super heartbreaking when you have a companion there watching it with you for moral support, but re-watching this second time around, I forgot how absolutely grim a lot of this show naturally is. As I mentioned before, the initial attack on the human race itself is seemingly very anticlimactic, but they really dial in and don't hold back on just the tragedy that ensues afterwards. But honestly, we used to watch the episodes at night, which maybe wasn't the greatest idea because I would spend so many nights just laying awake with just the images that we had seen in the show, like seared into my brain, like prohibiting me from going to sleep. There's definitely a lot of dark themes in the show, especially when you learn who the aliens actually are and who specifically they're targeting, what their reasoning was for wiping out the entire human population, what they actually want from us. Just brace yourself, it gets dark. Anyways, I wanted to segue into, this is partially obviously related to the show, but I need to just kind of vent about this a little bit because I still cannot freaking wrap my brain around this. I couldn't not discuss this. Basically, until we discover who the actual aliens are, which remains a mystery for a little bit after the initial attack, the survivors are terrorized by these animatronic AI robot dogs. And at first when you see them appear in the show in the aftermath, just when you think everything's fine and they survived the initial attack and it's all over, these things roll in and you're kind of just like, what? Because it doesn't necessarily look the most menacing, but holy F. <laughs> And they wreak havoc and absolutely terrorize everyone. And they basically go around hunting and eliminating any survivors by either shooting them or drilling a hole in their head. Which is, like I said, there's graphic and tragic and crazy things in this show and that is just one of them. They have this little mechanism that shoots out like lightning speed and just pew. So, you can imagine my absolute utter surprise when I was lurking on Twitter one day and just saw a video like this. Note, these things have clearly been around now. In my research, that video, that video there is from like when, I don't even know, 2019? These things have been around. I had just never seen one of them, nor did I know they existed in our real world until after I watched the entirety of this show. Oh, hell no. 
in which these things become enemy number one. They literally are killers. So for the sake of this video, I wanted to do a little research to be like, what are these? What are these and why? Just why? I don't want to spread any fear mongering or any misinformation. I don't want anyone to be afraid of these because you can actually buy, you can own one of these. Did you know that? But just to disclaim before I totally fear monger about these things, uh, it's only coming from a place of I went through the entirety of this series absolutely uh, terrified of these things and then to my surprise learned that they're actually real and probably will only at the the rate things are going nowadays that they're probably just going to become more popular best selling we're here on unite tree unitree i can't freaking unitree robotics high performance quadruped robots this literally is the exact same model that's in the epic show it's in the show you can buy one they're out of stock who has this if you or anyone you know has an extra $13,000 laying around, or I guess you could get this other model for $5,000, um, who... All right, I really don't want to be knocking these things because, again, my experience, my knowledge of them is only coming from the show where they were absolutely terrorizing the, the remaining survivors of humanity. So I don't know what the purpose of these is. What do you do? Here we go. What is Stanford doing? All right, this is fresh. This is from October 4th, 2023. New dog, old tricks. New AI approach yields athletically intelligent robotic dog. With a simplified machine learning technique, AI researchers created a real-world robo-dog able to leap, climb, crawl, and squeeze past physical barriers as never before. And then here's a parkour uh, demonstration. I'm not gonna watch that. Someday when quakes, fires, and floods strike, the first responders might be packs of robotic rescue dogs rushing in to help stranded souls. Now I feel bad. Okay, I stand corrected. Quadrupeds? would use computer vision to size up obstacles and employ dog-like agility skills to get past them. Huh. So they actually have a real world purpose. I'm so ignorant. But I guess it's all about, uh, you know, how you're first introduced to this new age of technology here. Maybe I can get over my fear of these robo-dogs as if these are about to be the heroes of the future, but... <laughs> Just brace yourself if you watch the show because they are not the heroes. That's a really random way to end this video, but this is something that I had just wanted to talk about for the longest time because I still, I don't know, if anyone else is terrified when they see videos like this of these animatronic dogs, uh, you know, let me know, but I feel bad knocking on them now that I know that they have a greater purpose. Please, by all means, if you're more educated on this technology than I am and on, you know, the purposes and the benefits of these quadrupeds here, feel free down below share some more please uh, dispel my fears about these things but yeah that's a really random way to end this video I just had to get that off my chest thank you guys so much for watching this War of the Worlds is available to stream on MGM plus formerly known as epics it is visually stunning the performances are incredible it's really neat to see the evolution of the characters again when they are put into these extreme circumstances these dire situations when it's life or death and again I think I was just so especially moved by this show in particular as a portrayal of post-apocalyptic events because they make it feel so accurate and so real and even though we haven't lived through anything like that and hopefully never will it's very believable that this is how things might go down please this is my rally cry if you have seen this show definitely let me know please let's talk about it i need somebody else tom i love you but i need somebody else to talk about this show anyways thank you guys so very much for watching this and let me know what you guys think of this style of video i definitely want to make another video similar to this but on the series yellow jackets which is not sci-fi at all it is literally so unrelated to anything i've ever covered on my channel but i truly love it it and I feel just as passionately about that show and I could talk about it forever and similarly with this I just selfishly need people to talk about it with so I'm gonna just make a video about it so hope you guys are doing so well as always and I will see you guys again very very soon bye guys